body felt, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's kind of antithetical to uh, realizing our potential in intellect. Right. No, because I argue that if, uh, if the Arawak and the Tainos had been uh, dealing with sort of abstract cognitive symbol-symbol referencing, uh, instead of the more limbic, sort of emotional body felt, you know, retired in the countryside, bows and arrows. I mean, they, uh, they would have met Columbus with helicopters. Mm. Right? So, even Europe was still caught up in a lot of attachment to that past way of cognizing, because, I mean, they, they could have gone further than cannon and, you know, steel swords uh, also. Uh, what about so, their dependency on Africans for, for steel? Well, uh, what happened though is that they appropriated the techniques, you know, as usual. And right. then you, you appropriate, uh, like you appropriate oil, you know, you just... Well, you appropriate you history. Just, you just... <laughs> like a carjack, you know. Right. So... But more the, subtle. The, uh, yeah, well, bigger bigger troops and more guns, <laughs> kind of thing you'd imagine somebody, an army approaching your car saying, well, you want to have your car, sir. <laughs> Gladly, you could step out, right? I mean, this huge army kind of thing. The, the point I'm, I guess I'm trying to make is that there's no question about the fact that the po poverty is disenfranchises you. It, it takes you away from your potential. Mm -hmm. Because, like, for 180,000 years, we've all been sapiens, sapiens, you know, we've all had the same biobrain system architecture. We've all had the same potential that Einstein had, the same. And yet, we insist on not understanding how our culture itself can work against our potential. And so we become very loyal to a culture process that inherent to it, to its cognitiveness, to its sort of limbic emotional body feltness, which comes out of being disenfranchised from development in, we'll call it luc introspective lucidity and in intellect. You know, where you have this sort of self-reflective insight that, that allows you to solve problems in a more objective way. Mm -hmm. right? Call it science, if you like. Uh, so, you have the dropout rate, for instance, is unbelievable as part of that culture of rejecting intellect. But it, it makes sense because intellect becomes the enemy of emotional body feltness. And emotional body feltness is a psychosomaticness of identity and sense of self that to surrender it to abstract cognition is like dying. And so it's not, it's not that young people, uh, you know, can't read, that decide not to read, which is sort of my attitude about it, just like people who say, I don't remember my dreams, I could say, well, you refuse to remember your dreams. To take that kind of responsibility, to say, yeah, uh, if I learn how to read uh, and become really fluent in language, It'll start pushing me into abstract cognitiveness, and that's going to be a great threat to my emotional body felt in the sense of identity. I won't be able to feel, to be soulful anymore, and not understand that, uh, that the abstract cognitive, the intellectual, has a soulfulness that is on this more etheric level, but is soulful. Right? It's like... Um, you know, you live next to the Third Avenue L, and like I used to, and you know, this above ground kind of train, and you hear that, and the racket goes by, you move in the first week, you know, it's sort of like you're born into the underclass, and the first week it's all rattling by, and eventually you don't hear it. Eventually it's part of your reality, right. it's part of your sense of identity, and then you move to a place where it's, you don't have that rattle, and, and you're upset. You know, why am I living in all of this quiet, right? I mean, I don't even feel like I'm in love with the person I'm seeing. We haven't had one fight, not one squabble, not one smack, not one tears and running and, I mean, that kind of culture, a kind of acculturation where, you know, 
have to sort of deconstruct it. I mean, essentially, that should be the role of education, except part of the loyalty to that culture is getting freaked out when someone wants to deconstruct it. Right? So we create all sorts of, you know, ethnic centricness to sort of hold us into that space out of that trepidation, out of that fear and anxiety that you feel as you're being sort of drawn away from that sense of identity and emotional body felt. So, as an educator, I see that as the critical issue. And in art educating, I see that especially relevant. Okay? And I see that especially relevant in any kind of spiritual work we might do. In other words, it should all be done with an introspective lucidity in intellect. You shouldn't go into a trance, you know, and not have this potential of our biobrain system in the present of our sapiens sapiens. Like we go back here and we go back to our most ancient two million years ago, H. habilis, you know, where we're very visceral and quote unquote animal like, feral like, more than sapiens sapiens human like. We go back there and, uh, and, and we reach back into those millions of years. And we say, that's who I am, right? Well, I mean, who I am is what our acculturation is. And then you might move into the center and you get real emotional and sentimental, right? And uh, retributive also. You know, you, someone hurts you, you hurt them. I mean, it's very dramatic. And then you come up here. It's almost like you break it down this way. Yahweh, Jehovah, the Messiah. Okay? So salvation then is the prefrontal lobe. And all visioning within the third eye comes to the forebrain. It doesn't come out the back. Okay? But to the extent that we're loyal to the back here, that vision that comes forward comes forward dragging a lot of that ancient idea of who we are and what we do with it. Okay. So we can argue from all the research that's done, like with 40 hertz temporal lobe resonance, which is significant, certainly within epilepsy, of uh, vision. Right? That's why there are a lot of epileptics that speak to God during their epileptic attacks. They uh, even experience, uh, in the milder epilepsies, abductions by UFOs. They talk to saints. <laughs> sure. heavy stuff, you know, what's life all about, <laughs> where we come from, where we're going, is there a God? <laughs> so, I mean, the point you were making about the uh, Falkuth and so on, right. these designating specific uh, organs, um, glandular systems, uh, as sort of energy centers right. uh, within a prayer context, within a meditation. The original Lord's Prayer itself, mm -hmm. you know, like the secret of it, mm -hmm. is that process, you know, right. where you say, you say, O Divine Mother, Father God, who art in heaven, mm -hmm. uh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will, kingdom be come, done will be done in earth. That is in heaven. Yeah. 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 Back here, kidneys, right. adrenals, about the kidneys, mm -hmm. cells of lytic, bottom of the belly, gonads, 
right? That's Hello. that's the inner church. I mean, that's a good conversation to bring Elaine Pagels in on. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So when you when you say the prayer, you're supposed to be focusing on those glandular areas, right? Right? Because when you say, uh, "O Divine Mother, Father, God, O Lord in Heaven," you know, and you go, you go. And you go, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So will is located here mm -hmm. in earth, from down here, then we go to earth, right? We go to the uh, thymus, mm -hmm. we go to the uh, solar plex, uh, which also includes, that's part of the energy systems, the uh, plexus. And then you go to the cells of, you go to the adrenals, you go to the cells of lytic, and then you drop down to the gonadal area. And you say, uh, Our Father, right in heaven, help you, thine, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And as in, uh, through the Christ Jesus, we are given each day our daily bread, right? Which is go now. Mm -hmm. right? And we are delivered from all temptation, which then goes to the cells of Lydic. And we are delivered from all evil, which comes up here to the thymus, which is an important purification to keep the body healthy, mm -hmm. and evil becomes connected to all things that injure the self, psychological, physical, etc., mm -hmm. spiritual. Let's see, do this for me before. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever right. and ever. Amen. And that's lost, of course, that's all of that kind of connecting up with, first of all, what those glandular systems mean and so on. But um, I guess the, the point I'm making, too, is an important one, that in a sense we're all betrayed by our culture and its art, without understanding it. Right? We're all betrayed. And how are we betrayed? We're betrayed because we've been acculturated to it, we've bonded with it, we've psychosomatically become part of it, despite the fact that we have no understanding of what role it has in our cognitiveness, in our sense of self and identity, and how that affects our potential within all those areas. So that we're willing to accept the boundaries that our acculturation creates for us as who we are, what we're about, what we'll ever be. Okay? But if we examine the potential we have as human beings, right? And we understand all of these to the extent that we understand all of our bioplasmic field and its relationship to all bioplasmic fields and its relationship to all energy within the entire universe and how that operates and what our potential is in cognition and what our, in fact, place is within all of this, okay? In order to do that, we have to deconstruct our culture and the aesthetic within which we understand art to happen. Is this where deconstructivism comes into play? Um, I think it's, it's the intention of most spiritual work that has been defeated by the traditions that have organized within the spiritual work. Right. So, as an artist, I then understand that we're sort of, there's, an, there's a stage, an intermediary, intermediary stage, and we'll call that stage the deconstruction of the old, you know, aesthetic that holds us to a cognitiveness that resists our developing free will in intellect. We develop will in id, or id will in intention, is what we develop. Why? Because our acculturation is out of its tradition ancient millions of years. I mean, you can go back to the chimpanzee and move forward, you know, through Australopithecines and through Achebelis and finally into Sapien Sapiens. But we have Sapien Sapiens only 180,000 years. Achebelis is only 2 million years ago. We go back to the chimpanzee, we got at least 7 million years. So we spent at least 5 million years running around climbing trees and collecting fruit and you know call it the garden of eden if you like okay 
although there are all sorts of debates about the initial, you know, a certain stage of culturation process within Sapiens Sapiens, but because only 10,000 years ago was not a long time. So if you go back those five million years and, and that loyalty to that culture, I mean, look at how loyalty we are to our culture now. Whatever acculturation we've had, however much we're struggling within it, we believe in it, okay? We're not ready to deconstruct it and give it up. I mean, it's like calling your parents liars. Right? Right? It's like calling half of the people you've studied with, educators in your life, liars, who've, in a sense, spent most of their time moving us in some kind of interesting, hopefully happy way from our anti-intellectual sort of position aesthetically to one that isn't quite as anti-intellectual. Although we haven't been pointed to that sort of idea of introspective lucidity and intellect so that we can then deconstruct all of our acculturation that holds us to limbic logic or to what they call iconic indexical referencing as the logic within which we sort of determine what reality is, which is very mushy. It's very mushy. You have to get into symbol, symbol referencing, and you have to move from there into objectivity and abstraction, and then from there move into free will and intellect, and move into a conscience and a, an ethics that, that in, in a sense, engages that free will in intellect which means that you don't say, I know, you say, wait, let me do a little research. Let's see what I come up with. The people who argue that, uh, okay, uh, well, anybody can do research and you can reach any conclusion you want to, well, of course. I mean, that's part of the struggle. But to what extent can you understand your research to be objective? Mm -hmm. All right? I mean, we know there's junk science. There's junk spiritual work also. Right. Okay, so I would say that to the extent that art, which I would say is at the center of everything, it's at the center of spiritual work, it's at the center of all work. Mm -hmm. To the extent that that work is dominated by iconic indexical referencing, you are in some kind of real mushy place, you're all over the place, but guess what? It ends up serving um, what we've generalized as evil intention. Okay? Now, evil intention can be simply charging too much interest on a loan. Now, you understand what I'm, I'm getting at? That it can be subtle, it can be extreme. It can be sanctifying the warrior as they go off to destroy. Okay? When we arrive at a deconstruction of that ancient logic, that we're still connected with in our brain itself because our brain itself has that ancient architecture and it has the more recent architecture with the prefrontal lobe and the wiring that goes with it. To the extent that that ancient brain is dominating the prefrontal lobe potential, a more recent sort of miracle, okay, in evolution, then all of that intelligence simply serves it. Right? instead of it serving the intelligence. In other words, if our ancient emotional body feltness propelled our intellect to full realization, that, then we would be in the proper relationship with this biobrain system architecture and its potential. That means all the spiritual work would suddenly be moved into a realm of intellect and introspectiveness that is traditionally ignored within the kind of dogmas that have evolved within spiritual work. At least the dogmas for the masses. Well, I, I believe that, I believe that uh, we're all locked into the dogma, in whatever level we're working. That's why I'm saying that the first thing to question is wherever you are, in an aesthetic, mm -hmm. in whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. that it betrays you. Just accept that as automatic. That means now the search is, what about it betrays me? Wait a second. Okay? And then suddenly you're unraveling all sorts of things that you can finally understand 
that are betraying you. They're holding you back from full spiritual realization. Because you've decided that this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. This is the answer. Well, we know that, you know, as you think of the earth as flat, yeah, sure, you'll fall off the end. Okay, but if the earth is, well, now we know it's sort of pear-shaped. And you just, you know, sort of keep going round. I mean, eventually you can keep going round and round and round and round, and it's a never-ending journey. And you're always discovering new things, but hey, wait a second. There's stuff out there. Right? And so you have this old Fritz Lang movie of the rocket going to the moon, right? And the people running around, you know, with these diving bell outfits. But I mean, in an attempt to understand, to make sense out of all of that. But once you move out there, you notice that what you carry with you, like the Fritz Lang movie, is your sense of what's happening here. That's the betrayal. Okay? It's, to what extent, to what extent was the culture itself, just like the Arawak Taino culture, out of its cognitiveness, didn't meet Columbus with a helicopter, okay, met him with these kind of nice dugouts and some bows and arrows and, you know, like the indigenous here decided to whatever the mythology might be, to accept the beads not knowing that in the process they had surrendered a lot of land. Right? Again, the culture betrayed the Aborigine as much as the culture of the betrayer betrayed the betrayer. Right? Because there's an interesting relationship between the competitiveness that we're operating in, which is very much like the ancient culture, like the two million years ago. There was no conscience. We were, in a sense, engaging sense of self the way nature engages in its process. There's no conscience in nature. And anyone that wants to argue that is betraying themselves. Okay? Nature makes no distinction between what lives and what dies. It's a question of millions of years of things living and dying and transmuting and adapting to particular places and times. Not to adapt within nature itself to anything outside of the context within which it adapts. Okay? Except we came along. Finally, sapiens, sapiens, and we can adopt anywhere, any place, providing we fulfill our potential in intellect. We can design these things that go deep underwater. We can design these things that go off into deep space. Okay? But we can argue, wait a second, the ancients didn't have to deal with materiality. They could travel in their in minds, in their, their eye. They can distant view and so on. Okay? Let's assume that is in fact true. Okay? Let's not argue with that. All of the systems that we've decided make that possible don't even touch the surface of it. That would be like looking at a blackboard with some formula that, that some string theorist left behind, and you're making sense out of your calculus, you know, that you studied, or algebra, and you're trying to make sense of that formula, and you catch little bits and pieces of it, and you think you've got it. Okay, that's where we are with spiritual work. Right? So, if we go back, looking closely at what our architecture is, was, what's its potential. And then try to understand how we, uh, in a sense, we have to discover what processes are at the center of our organizing and aesthetic that we call fact or that we call truth. Right? Because we can argue that there are really no facts and truths within spiritual work, mm -hmm. but that's all part of the problem of saying, well, I don't know if the earth is flat or round, I don't know if it's pear shaped, I mean, we, we, you know, it's possible, it's all those things. Mm -hmm. So, it's kind of like these 
Druids, so-called Druids, 28,000 that have gathered at Stonehenge for the summer solstice. I mean, give me a break. You could just as well go up to the top of the Empire State Building, look out, and say, you know, this is much more powerful than standing around in these stones and stone heads. I mean, I understand they resonate and all of that, and, mm -hmm. but hey, there's a fence around the whole thing. I can't really be amongst them, but hey, I could take half a dozen magnets and surround myself with them in certain ways, and I could feel all that resonance. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? That that the notion of a, a site in itself, th this attachment, okay, this attachment to uh, to these traditional ways of arriving these things, when we have all of the potential within intellect to arrive at all of these transmutations, at all of these spiritual awakenings within a contemporary context, if we understand within the more contemporary context what we in fact are about materially and spiritually. Okay, I mean it's like the first time you go to an acupuncturist. Suddenly you're discovering all these fields of energy that are operating in you and how that you can feel the flow of this energy and so on. Okay. Some people argue, well I felt like that when I saw this psychic healer, you know, laid the hands on me and did some polarity and stuff like that. Yeah, that's part of the ancient idea, but in the process we understand that you also get a transfer of whatever their karma is and so on and so on, because every energy, energy field has narrative. And, and when someone comes to you with their energy field at bringing their narrative, and you say, well, no, they let go of the narrative because they say, oh, divine powers flow through me. Yeah, well, I mean, divine powers, the Akasha, there are comic books there too. You know, there are a lot of pranksters and jokesters out there in the spirit realm as well. Mm -hmm. So the notion, I, I think of someone like Ed Casey who developed this whole attitude about don't pay attention to all those dark shadows that you pass as you go into this deeper state of consciousness. Well, maybe he didn't see some of the more transparent, darker shadows, more clever and subterfuge and disguise, right? Mm -hmm. The point is, if we can be suspicious that there is a betrayal waiting at every corner of our mind, and that it comes out of these millions of years of acculturation that has embedded itself, if you like, in the cellular. Okay. And this is what I meant about the psychosomatic factor in acculturation. When you move from the limbic logic, from this sort of iconic indexical into symbol, symbol, abstraction, and intellect, and it's introspective, mm -hmm. okay, you then can argue with yourself around these betrayals. You can then find a way to deconstruct it so that it doesn't compromise you in the process sounds a little skizzy. Okay, an example. You're doing an artwork, and you've studied art with me, so you, you know the process. <laughs> if you remember the process. Uh, the idea of looking at color and, and making a distinction between the subjective and objective relationship to it. Already you're thinking about it in some way with intention that pushes towards intellect. Well, how do I feel about red? Well, red makes me feel this way, makes me feel uh, energy and, and power and war and blah, 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 right? Okay, then we go to orange. But wait, someone else says, no, no, red makes me feel peaceful. Okay, and someone else says, no, oh, no, no, red, red uh, for me is depressing. Okay, now, now which out of, out of a sense of acculturation. Mm -hmm. No, no, uh, someone else says, no, red, I hate red. I hate it. I hate the color. And so you ask each, you say, well, why, why is red for you something that makes you feel like power? And the person says, I don't know. Okay, this is, again, acculturation 
that is iconic and Dexter goes, I don't know. But meanwhile, if you break that down, you say, okay, introspect. And someone says, finally, after going through all sorts of, you know, movies and all sorts of toys and so on that they had that were red, that they, the red tank or whatever, uh, they say, oh, well, uh, yes, I, I, uh, I had a, an uncle who was a politician and he always used to wear uh, a red tie whenever he was making a speech. This really bright red tie. And when he spoke, he had so much power. You know, everyone applauded him and so on. Okay, we begin to find then our relationship to red within that subjectivity, within that acculturation of meaning. Okay, then we talk to someone who says, no, but red is depressing. It's depressing. Well, they make connections with someone wearing red that punished them. Some idea of meaning of red as being really negative passed on by someone with authority. Okay, someone who said, it's the color of the devil. Okay, well, see, that's depressing. If someone put red on me, then I'd be like a devil, and then I'd go, you know, I'd be burning in hell, and you understand what I'm saying? That this, this iconic indexical relationship is your, sort of like your folk acculturation. That betrays us most. And it comes out of, mostly, those closest to us. Those that we're most uh, dependent on for our sense of identity. Okay. They betray, they've been betrayed by their culture and acculturation, and prior to them, their parents were betrayed, and so on and so on, and so you sort of fall into that same sort of state of helplessness without understanding it as that. So then you decide, I'm going to do a little research. I want the more up objective potential of my relationship to these colors, and you find out about the physiology of color. You understand the psychology of color. You understand how acculturation binds you to a lot of these accidents of meaning, where the science releases you from them. And I'm not talking about junk science now. I'm not talking about science that wants to prove that, you know, God exists or, you know, that the amoeba doesn't. I, you, you understand? Uh, it's like that issue with the, uh, with the genome. Uh, no one could see a genome until one person argued for most of their lives that the genome exists and they saw it and before you know it a few people began to see it and more saw it and more saw it and it was like some sort of virus of seeing that spread and so everyone saw it. Okay. Um, that My favorite story is um, these two children, uh, one of them is in this room full of toys, just full of toys. Every, I mean, it was like a Santa Clausville, you know. And, but was sitting in the corner with its face against the wall in the corner. And the child was asked, with all these toys, why, why aren't you playing with any of the toys? And he said, well, I'm afraid, or, you know, for gender equality, she said, I'm a, I'm afraid uh, that if I play with the toy, I'll break it. Okay. Then they flash over to the next scene, and they go into this barn, and they see this kid in this huge pile of horseshit, just digging into this pile of horseshit. <laughs> Hey, what, what are you doing? You, you look like an insane child. You know, I mean, just throwing these horseshit little balls back over his shoulder. And for equity, we can say, her shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, they say, well, will you please tell me what you're doing? Because this looks insane. He says, I know there's a pony in here. I know there's a pony in here. Buried under all this horseshit, there's got to be a pony. Okay, so we have we have two different attitudes. Which one betrays more? Which one betrays less? But certainly, they're both a betrayal. Okay. 
How can one know if there's a pony under all that horseshit? Does it make sense to be a pony under all that horseshit? And what is it a metaphor of? And the same thing with the toys, the room just full of toys and facing against the wall. I'll break the toy. What metaphor is in that? We spend most of our time within that space of metaphor. And we don't come to and, and enjoy the mushiness of it. And we don't enjoy the kind of search within the more objective intellectual, let, let's say a string theorist, involve themselves in. Because they're like looking for particles as if they were looking for a pony inside of a pile of horseshit. But they organize it to all sorts of symbols that they can then go back and examine. Okay, and it's not mushy, although you could think of it originally as mushy. In other words, to what extent did that ancient brain of iconic and dexical, which is sort of fundamental to metaphors, how can that serve right, our potential in intellect? So if you work on a on an art object. If you think of your intention as an artist as developing a visual language, developing a language of self-expression that has some coherence between this subjective side, call it poetic if you like, which is the ancient brain, iconic and dexical, and find that inspiring the more objective prefrontal lobe potential we have in symbol symbol referencing okay and finally free will and intellect and if we combine the two we in a sense respect our existing acculturation and all of the mushiness of it and we and we think of that as as having its integrity okay it has its integrity mm -hmm. but you're not going to let it rule. You're not going to let it make the decisions about the conclusions you draw, but you're going to have it simply inspire your search for the fact of it. Okay? Then, as we gain more and more sense of visual language, and we gain more and more sense of the distinction between the subjective side of that visual language and the objective side of it, slowly moving, it's almost like, you know, how do you give up cigarette smoking? It's sort of slowly moving through all of the introspectiveness of it and all of the, the failure that, that the acculturation of the past uh, and is like inherent to it. Mm -hmm. All of that failure that's inherent to it is holding us back from realizing our full potential. So that you're always saying, hey, old ancient me, I, I give you integrity, I give you attention, but hey, keep in mind that I'm interested in moving into the present of my potential. Okay, I'm not gonna throw you out like the baby with the bath water. Okay, I'm, I'm simply Understand, I'm, I'm doing this with loving care. You know, I'm not going to give myself some shock treatments. I'm not going to drug myself into some transcendental state and, uh, in a sense, indulge you and empower you and uh, not fulfill my potential and I'm not going to sabotage you or myself but you have to understand I have a greater potential in the present and I want some empathy and understanding from you okay and so you're constantly evolving your objective relationship to things you go introspectively into the whole subjective realm and you inform it with your objectivity constantly informing it constantly informing it. And after a while, okay, with this visual language, with not only color, with texture, meaning of textures, uh, shapes, sounds, all of the possible metaphors, but then also 
within the science of what the potential of each is. For instance, uh, there are certain frequencies we know that cause um, acidophilus, uh, the kind of stuff you see in yogurt. Certain frequencies cause great multiplication of the acidophilus, but other frequencies kill all the acidophilus. Well, guess what? You go around whistling using the frequency that kills all the acidophilus. Right. Well, that's your whistle. I mean, that's the way your family taught you to whistle, and you had an uncle that whistled, an aunt, your father, your mother whistled, sister whistled, and that was the, the frequency. Okay, your voice frequency. Where does that come from? I mean, you've been on the phone and you say, uh, hello, uh, Mark, and they say, no, no, this is uh, uh, John, this is the son, son, my dad is, right? Uh, or, or depending if the association is more specifically with the mother, then, you know, you say, uh, uh, hi, uh, uh, Mary, and the guy will say, uh, you know, in a high voice, saying, no, this is the sun, right? In other words, the frequency is part of the uh, embrace, the acculturated embrace with uh, those that, in a sense, condition us, okay? Same thing with weight, the same thing with, you know, we, we adaptation is such a fantastic thing, okay? So, as we evolve the idea of intention to move to a kind of introspective lucidity, introspective lucidity in intellect, that serves both sides moving towards intellect. The assumption being that we understand, uh, although it, it certainly has been corrupted, the notion of intellect has been corrupted radically that we're constantly reinvesting our understanding of the meaning of intellect and understanding the meaning of free will in intellect and understanding also finally, I mean, this is the conclusion, where you uh, perhaps just simply, however superficially you might imagine its meaning, that without free will and intellect there is no free will. Okay? We only have limbic will. We only have iconic indexical will. And that's very mushy, very primitive. And it generally uh, hangs out, you know, back here, which means all the solutions are always um, emotional, body felt, threatening, that don't sort of come uh, as resolutions that satisfy us. Okay. And that accounts also for all of the violence to the self and the other because the assumption is that when someone rejects you, they've made some wound in, in you, physically. Whereas when you're abstract about it, you examine the uh, idea, uh, well, this person hates me. Well, uh, this person is uh, kind of, you know, they're busy betraying themselves and everybody around them. And, uh, and I can understand, in, you know, what possible things are going on with this person. Number one, they're operating at a very primitive level cognitively, right? And uh, as long as they don't reach out for me, you know, I don't have to give them an elbow across the forehead. I mean, right? That's, and then you say, wait a second, what am I, how am I thinking? Okay? I just walk away. What am I doing, you know, doing this analysis, you know, with this person making eye contact, which we know within the ancient cognitiveness is a challenge. Huh? So, all of these factors then, just like you'd say, uh, I think it's time for me to climb this tree, okay, because this uh, dumb creature is coming at me, and it's either kill or be killed, you know, I mean, this kind of thing, psychologically killed, psychologically, or be killed psychologically, you know, this kind of thing. Well, I mean, we've got these two legs, I mean, you just turn around and, and you run, right? Or, you stay within the ancient brain and you say, wait a second, I got my black belt in the karate. I did my mutai, I, you know, studied my Kung Fu, and, and I have a gun. <laughs> you understand? So you're locked, you're betrayed. It's the total betrayal. 
There you are, locked into the betrayal. The world is like it was millions of years ago. And so we have to behave as if it's millions of years ago. And I'm not talking about us becoming doormats and not letting ourselves be abused. We're talking about how do you solve conflict in an introspective, lucid, intellectual way, rather than an ancient, limbic, emotional, physical way? How do you make, how do you peel away the acculturation that holds us? That someone says finally, well, yeah, if you're in the corner and you're up against the wall and somebody's threatening you, I mean, you'll, you'll strike back. And I would say, wait a second, uh, why should I be in the corner up against the wall? Well, I mean, what if you were? I said, well, what if I wasn't? Why do I have to be in a corner up against the wall? How did I get into that corner up against the wall in the first place? What kind of dumb thinking was I doing that I ran into this corner? Okay, whether it's in my mind, or whether it's out here in the real world, or whether it's in the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. These are the things that I believe artwork can really work on in in a very successful way, because it makes a bridge between the nonverbal, the preverbal, the verbal, the postverbal, and it joins them all together, but always in your mind with the intention of that potential for symbol symbol referencing, that potential for objectivity, that potential for free will and intellect to be served. And and it means looking carefully at pedagogy carefully at the kind of curriculum you design, that it serve the development of a visual language. And I'm, I use the term visual language, I call it a language of self-expression, that um, makes the bridge between the subjective and the objective into an intellectual understanding of the encoding process an understanding of the alchemy that's at the center of that encoding process that moves us towards that objectivity. So that you understand, for instance, that the reason the horizontal line, in fact, although you can say, I really, when I see the horizontal line, I get really upset. You know, I just hate it. Well, uh, you could make a metaphor with it and say, well, I guess when you were little, uh, they told you to lay down a lot and you hated it. Well, what do you mean? Well, when you lay down your horizontal thing. So what is, the, uh, what is the objectivity of, of color theory? If you have subjectivity where... The objectivity uh, would be understanding physiologically, for instance, that uh, in terms of values, the visual purple breaks down with very bright values. And when the visual purple breaks down, it excites the nervous system. When you have dark values, the visual purple builds up. When the visual purple builds up, it calms the nervous system. I mean, this is an example. Someone else might say, or when you ask, you say, how did you feel about being in the dark when you were a kid? And someone says, oh, I hated it. It just was so scary. I insisted they put the light on. So I said, well, if you're working on a narrative, okay, let's deal with just abstraction. If you were taking a sheet of paper and you were painting it a value and, and your intention was for that sheet of paper to reflect the scariness, what value would you use? You've already acculturated yourself to the notion that the darker values, are that they're significant of darkness where as a child certainly you were frightened. You could say, but yeah, but that was a long time ago. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm always wearing black now. Okay, and then we'll say, well, uh, black, let's see, what, what associations can you make with black? Well, you can say, well, the bad guy always wears black and he's over there strong as life, or, you know, power of life and death and so on like that. And, or uh, you can say, well, um, I, I wear uh, black uh, because uh, it's counterphobic. <laughs> say, counterphobic, like someone got this, you know, somehow got caught in that word, 
Yeah, I used to really be afraid of black, and now I'm wearing black because uh, uh, instead of being phobic about black, I'm counterphobic. I'm wearing it, kind of thing. And then you say, oh yeah, it's like in uh, Grodek's book where this guy who was afraid of heights stand up on a chair and he would faint. And uh, he went to the uh, therapist, and the therapist uh, talked him through a lot of stuff, and he could stand on the chair and he doesn't faint. And he was able to even go up uh, to three or four stories and look out the window, and he didn't faint, and he went up to the roof, and he didn't faint. And But guess, I mean, this was wonderful because the guy wanted, he had friends who were mountain climbers. And he was just looking for the day that he would resolve this so he could climb mountains with his friends. Well, he started climbing mountains with his friends. On his first climb, right, climbed up with his friends and they went up to a ledge and uh, they all tied their sleeping bags, you know, into these anchors that they hammer into the rock. He hammered the anchors into the rock. He tied the sleeping bag to the anchors, except he tied them in a way where they would easily untie when he put weight onto it, when he rolled his sleeping bag forward. You know, when you're adjusting yourself, mm -hmm. you could see those cords getting looser and looser as he was adjusting himself in his sleeping bag. And in the morning, the guys woke up and they said, where's Jim? I don't know, where's Jim? And they look down and they see this red sleeping bag way down there. Okay? So, what was that all about? What was his hype? You say it's premonition? Self-fulfilling prophecy? I mean, he tied the knots. He drove the metal spikes into the stone. So, what was all of that resolving of his fear of height? How did he work with it? What was it about? You understand, this is the introspective lucidity and intellect that would have reached into all of that. Whatever therapy he was getting, it was, again, you could say, finally part of the betrayal. Whereas he himself already was in betrayal. And then he, you know, like we go out into the world and we're betrayed by others. Okay? Not, you could see it as, in certain circumstances, malicious you know, out of competition, out of the, what people call the killer instinct, you know, as we reach back to the ancient brain. But obviously that ancient brain was the dominant cognitive process going on. So an artwork that gives us all that insight about color and about resonance, I mean, we know, for instance, that there are tuning forks, you hit them and you put them on a sheet of metal that has filings on it, that, you know, has a central pole that's holding it, that those vibrations from the tuning fork will shape that sand into a certain shape. And we use a different tuning fork with a different frequency and it shifts again, carrying meaning of that frequency. Now you could say, wait a second, I'm listening to that tuning fork and I'll shape this. Right? Okay. Now, that's the shape I think that sound is. Okay, that's the subjective side of it. I want to see what the objective side of it is. Oh, look at how it's changing. Oh, look at that. Well, that's the kind of changes we need to make within ourselves. What would be the uh, the path to to obtaining the objective uh, definitions needed to do that, even in a painting with color, let alone the self? Well, <clears throat> let's assume you understand shape within visual language. You also understand the distinction between the more abstractness of a two-dimensional plane from a multi-dimensional plane. You understand that our relationship to time and space is more psychokinetic. That sculpture is in fact more visceral than a painting. 
but you can make a painting more visceral, like Jackson Pollock certainly did, or you can make it more intellectual, certainly like Rembrandt did, Da Vinci did, Caravaggio did, Raphael did, okay, Velasquez did, or more emotional body felt like de Kooning did, or you can make the painting more intellectual like Mondrian did. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean certainly Madame Blavatsky had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you have to have that kind of clarity. Of, you need to understand that you're working like performance is most visceral, and when you're deconstructing, you've got to deconstruct within that entire potential of, uh, in a sense, organizing narrative meaning within all of these vocabularies of self-expression, gesture, sound, out into time and space, more abstract, so that the art process has to encompass all of that potential, but always serving the development of the visual language, and the visual language on both sides, the subjective and the objective. And that's what you're working on. And, and, uh, and yes, at first, you're guessing, and first you're saying, oh well, let me see, a sphere to me seems uh, peaceful, and the triangle seems with those points a little aggressive. Someone else might say, no, I like those points, you know. That's all some chapters. Right? The objective I like would be circle. the science that you said, the real science, not the junk science that right. proves how it affects, how yellow affects you. Right, right. But we, we understand you have to understand that acculturation can turn all these things upside down. In other words, you can even do an electroencephalogram and, and it'll, it'll show, um, well let's say one of these gadgets that decide whether you're telling the truth or not. Well, they basically read anxiety and stress. So what if you're an anxiety prone, stressful person? They say that the uh, the um, lie detector machines don't uh, understand the Russian soul. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or or uh, Segal when they give it to him in his movies, he always beats the lie detector. And uh, supposedly that's part of the training, of, you know, certain people. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, yeah, that, that again is part of the problem. We're, we're kind of secret agents within our own personalities, right? Within our own sort of sense of identity, that's a cover identity, you know? And, uh, and, and again, that's part of the process of acculturation. It's like um, in, in the book of the id, Grotic has this sort of person unzip themselves and the real person comes out. You understand? It's, uh, although, again, that's where I came across that case history of the person climbing mountains, getting rid of their fear of height, and so on. Okay. Beyond ethnicity. Well. Um, you were born to parents in East Harlem? Uh, Williamsburg. Ah, okay. So the old Bushwick-Williamsburg yeah. neighborhood. And uh, my parents uh, were having some difficulties at that time. Their marriage split up, mm -hmm. and also been anxious. Uh, well, my mother was a little, as the story is told to me, and she had an aunt, uh, a sister. Excuse me, I had an aunt. She had a sister, who was my aunt, mm -hmm. who uh, lived on the Lower East Side. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, so like the first Latino families in the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. And she invited her sister, my mom, to move in with her. These were like uh, 
tenement buildings, or they they were the yeah, housing? Yeah, five-story walk-ups. Okay. Interestingly enough, it, it was uh, they were located uh, at Rutgers Place. Ah. Mm, right. <laughs> <Some> destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we moved in to that neighborhood, and the neighborhood was uh, prominently uh, European. German, Russian, Jewish, Orthodox. On the periphery, you know, it was near Chinatown, so uh, right. although there were a number of Irish and Italian families, mostly Russian, German, European, uh, Orthodox, Jewish families. And uh, I grew up in, in that neighborhood and moved up to Henry Street, a little further up on the Lower East Side, near the Henry Street Settlement, Education Alliance, and so on. That's where I... <coughs> well... Oh, we're talking about uh, moving to the Lower East Side. Right. Yeah, and that's where I... Uh, I began to take some art courses at the Henry Street Settlement, and. Uh, when we moved from Rutgers Place to uh, Henry Street, uh -huh. and when I was over at Rutgers Place, the, I went. We used to go to Education Alliance, which is about you know, four or five blocks away. Uh, at Henry Street, when I lived at Henry Street, it was m maybe a block and a half away. It was Henry Street Settlement, and at the Education Alliance, played basketball, uh, did all kinds of drawing and painting and so on. But then I, you know, I had an uncle was an artist, and uh, when I was a kid, uh, he used to visit, and everyone used to ooh and ah, you know. And uh, I, I simply would like, I liked the, the, the ooh and ah and he got. And, uh, you know, I was this little kid, and as usual, I got tired of people always yelling at me, telling me to sit still and stuff, and be quiet, and I discovered that my uncle could get these grown-ups to sit still and be quiet whenever he drew them. Mm -hmm. So my whole uh, idea of empowering myself was to learn how to draw and then to be able to tell these grown-ups to sit still and, and be quiet so I could draw them. And then soon I acquired that ability. He would uh, give me papers and pencils, charcoal pencils and stuff. And uh, Whenever he visited the house, he'd go over my drawings and do a little crit, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, I mean, at first they didn't quite look like my relatives. <laughs> uh, strange little teeny hands or, you know, an ear missing or something. But after a while, it, it, uh, they started looking like them and then they started the wing and eyeing. And meanwhile, at school, I was becoming the class artist and the school artist and stuff like that. Uh, what was interesting is in terms of my work, this idea of, of sort of demolition work that, uh, you know, we call like destruction art, disassemblage and stuff. When we were kids, um, uh, Madison, uh, rather, at, uh, when we were living at Rutgers Place, we had like a bunch of us, we used to climb a fence and go into this big empty lot with uh, a building that was sort of empty, vacant, and probably they were preparing to demolish it, but they weren't demolishing it. Mm -hmm. And those are the perfect buildings. I mean, in, in the barrio, it might have become a shooting gallery, you know, a, you know, with drug addicts and stuff. But in the Lower East Side, that wasn't the case. I mean, that was an important difference between uh, the, the barrio. And then I used to spend the summers in, uh, in Barrio Viejo. Uh, and um, when I went there, when I, I was about Nine, eight, nine years old till I was about eleven, or twelve till I was about twelve. The it was gangs, you know, one gang, this gang. It was like zip guns. It was people chasing you, or you chasing them, or kicking the crap out of someone, or getting the crap kicked out of you, or you know, it's all this violent, crazy, territorial imperative stuff. And on the Lower East Side, there wasn't any of that at all. I mean, it's really? just. None, zero, because we were the only Latino family. And it's interesting oh, about the, the underclass is that the, the European Jewish underclass 
because it, it in a sense was its class position came out of pogroms, came out of uh, whatever wealth and uh, material wealth they had, they always concerned themselves, especially in a relationship to uh, their uh, sacred literature. It's always questioning, it's always uh, trying to understand uh, different ways the laws could be interpreted and so on. So intellect uh, became really important as part of the culture even though it was the underclass, you know, German, Russian, Orthodox Jewish uh, families. And so, in they were, all of my, you could say all of my friends were Jewish. I mean, I had, I had some Christian friends. But their concern was to go to college, to become teachers, to possibly become lawyers, to understand this idea of understanding the importance of language fluency, of, of intellect and the culture and the society as, as a means for empowerment and making your way. I mean, certainly you could argue that anti-Semitism was is as debilitating, is as uh, psychologically harmful as racism. I mean, I mean, we have a Holocaust that can, you know, confirm that. Right? I mean, we have certainly slavery to confirm, you know, the, what happened to the indigenous in the Americas and the African mm -hmm. uh, in the Americas and here as well. So, uh, so none of that violent impulse asserting itself. And uh, that became a fascinating difference for me. So that after a while, I, I didn't want to spend summers in the Bahio. I would prefer spending, you know, spending summers at the summer camp from the Henry Street Settlement or the... That's interesting. Isn't that almost a... Um, you were alluding to earlier about uh, our ancient selves, or even our acculturated selves, it's our acculturatedness limiting us, or perhaps sending us off. And it's like a it's a polarity to be managed. Whereas you, you're describing these young guys who are essentially, you know, the, the you know the lat the Latino machismo thing. They're running around. It's it's just a nonstop. Well, see, I I wouldn't call it. Uh necessarily inherent to being Latino. Okay. And I think that even machismo is dealt with differently amongst the upper class Latinos than amongst the underclass mm. Latinos. I think that you find Latinos who are highly educated who are lawyers and doctors, their machismo asserts itself in a way that doesn't, uh, uh, certainly to the extent that they are not so recently from the underclass, because again, this acculturation hangs on sometimes for two and three generations. And to the extent that you in fact work on resolving these deeper uh, emotional, psychological um, sort of conditionings of the high generations as underclass, as you move into middle class, to the extent that that hasn't been reconciled and resolved, you know, as I say, within an introspective lucidity and intellect, uh, to that extent that your intellect might be serving this sort of uh, more ancient self, and so then you have lawyers who corrupt things and so on, and politicians who do corrupt things. It takes a number of generations to deconstruct, and with, with an effort to deconstruct that ancient retributive uh, reconciling of, of things. So, what? Uh, so I, I make that distinction that generally the middle and upper class Latino, who uh, are an, uh, who have been perhaps for a number of generations uh, in that place of um, middle and upper class, you know, it's educated. Uh, their parents were college educated. They're college educated. Their children are college educated, and they move on. Oh, it's through that generational process. There is this slow deconstruction. I mean, if, if they're fortunate, 
there is this slow deconstruction. Somehow it occurs intuitively, more or less self-consciously. Uh, in the process, children might see a good analyst and so on and so on. They might be in um, environments uh, that are supportive of intellectual development and not an environment like in the typical public school. The intellectual kids get the crap kicked out of them because they represent a threat to that sort of emotional body felt sense of identity. Uh, where when you move into these middle and up, you know middle class communities where intelligence is really respected and, and seen as valued and that in a sense it has equity. It's like night right. and day between Montclair and Madison. Right. <laughs> so in a sense for me uh, my mother moving out of Williamsburg and although she didn't really know what was going on in the body was when she sent me to my cousins for the summer uh, but after a while I just got in the contrast you know it was just the contrast of the culture on the Lower East Side which was uh, there were very few Latino families and, and if there were there were maybe three or four and they were cousins of mine you know who had uh, in a sense inspired by my aunts bragging about how peaceful the neighborhood was and uh, although in the meantime the, the community was saying there goes the neighborhood <laughs> you know well, I'm saying what I think what I was getting at is I mean how did these the the German uh, and Polish Russian Jewish families how did they I mean I understand the the, the bend towards the intellectualism in, in their community but how did they express their manhood or was it expressed at all that you could detect? Their relationship to God. Okay. Their relationship to God. And uh, that's, you know, we're talking about Judaism before uh, it, it became uh, as assertive as it is now. You know, you could say before, um, uh, before Israel had uh, atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs and huge armies and you know saw itself as never again and you know in this kind of real aggressive uh, way we're talking about before that time we're talking about when orthodoxy was not uh, insisting that uh, you know all these complicated issues of promised land and, and uh, how do you in a sense remove you know this notion of removing people from this idea that somehow they moved into your home and so there's no problem sort of, you know, pushing them out of theirs. I, this is before then. This is when Judaism was uh, a very uh, socially conscious, very uh, uh, politicized on the left, radically connected to you know, let my people go, and sort of seeing that as somehow relating to all people, and uh, and understanding the, that the Holocaust um, should never again for them, but never again for anyone. Uh, you know, it's a different, different. Uh, it was a, a, I would say, it was a different kind of political atmosphere within Judaism, within Orthodoxy. Um, I mean, I, I, I was also the Shabbat goy. You know, I, I went around and I, you know, families, Jewish families, I mean, they knew me, they trusted me, I, I turned the lights on and stuff like that, even at the synagogues. So, and I, uh, in fact, it's interesting, some of the uh, Kabbalistic material was, uh, there was a, a rabbi that uh, a group of us, and some of my Jewish friends and myself, we'd have a lot of conversations with, and, and there were discussions about Kabbalah and stuff. And I had an interesting book I was given to me to read at one point, uh, Broad Lavin Theory of Numbers. Which is, in other words, that whole background served as a, for me, a foundation into the kind of more mystical side of spiritual study. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're, um... But let me, let me, oh, uh, just, yeah, let me uh, continue with that. So, um, that then becomes an important, uh, for me, an important insight into this idea of uh, culturation and cognition. And uh, while, while I was then busy planning to go 
certainly to finish high school and to go to college. Uh, they were busy dropping out and being real scornful of the idea of wasting your time in school. And intellect was for them totally at no value at all. I mean, some of them, the big idea of success was uh, the whole gangster culture. Uh, um, so, within the perhaps the underclass notion of, as you said, machismo, which is there's a difference between being intellectually macho versus being physically macho. Sure. Sure. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, I, we could argue that in the in the uh, Jewish Orthodox, you know, European sort of cultural atmosphere of, of uh, the Lower East Side. But if there's a machismo, it was to accomplish in, in some way intellectually. Okay. There's, we we'll call it pride, if you like, as, as an alternative to the term machismo. It was a, a pride in uh, finishing school, getting good grades, um, moving on to college. Um, that, that was all talked as, about as important, you know, ah, oh, my brother finished and my sister finished and so and so. Finished high school, they're going on to city college and, you know, that whole attitude about it. Of course, I, I ended up, uh, in order to get an education because my parents were underclass and but out of the Latino sense of it, the notion of going on to university wasn't in the foreground, sort of like way in the background, if at all. Because I, I argue, for instance, uh, amongst each class there are three levels. There is the under underclass, there is the middle underclass, and there is the upper underclass. I considered ourselves upper underclass. So we were, we were sort of in, in touch with, in some interface, with the bottom of the middle class and the notion of class mobility mm -hmm. and the role of education within the achieving of class mobility. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, you know, we were just really fortunate, I could say, very fortunate. M you know, my sister went on to university and she went on to do graduate work and she was teaching also, again, that comes out of that whole idea of all of our friends all. And it's interesting, my Irish and Italian friends, uh, a lot of them just dropped out of high school and uh, the few that finished uh, that, you know, that was the extent of it and they managed to get through by the hair of their chinny chin chin. So, you know, they weren't really interested in developing any kind of cue that would get them into I was going to say that, you know, there wasn't the Upper East Side predominantly Italian when the Puerto Ricans started coming in? No. No? Mm -mm. Was that just the lower? Yeah, that's the lower end. That's near, near Little Italy, that's around the, near China. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, not, not the Lower East Side. Um, I'm speaking of um, Spanish Hall. Uh, I'm not too familiar with the history. I mean, when I, I, I remember, I mean, I'm thinking of like Piri Thomas book. Because when I was... Down these mean streets, he's talking about he's coming and he's the only Puerto Rican kid on the block and, he's, and they all think he's black. <laughs> well, I mean... And he moved to... I mean, there, is the, there is the Afro-Latino, you know, gene pool, but... Uh, uh, well, they were all Italian, is what I'm saying, I'm, from his report. I'm... We're talking what years? We're talking about the 40s? A little bit before that. He's, he's Late 30s? That. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, Marc Antonio was uh, elected to Congress. He was Italian. He was uh, lefty left. I believe he was a, a communist. Uh, <laughs> was the, the rumor? I don't, I don't uh -huh. know. But I mean, that's when, when uh, the, the left politics, um, in a sense, were still in some positions of power. From what I understand, the turn of the century, the Italians gave the Puerto Ricans a hard time in moving in and sort of 
Well, that that's happened with each group, right? You know, the English. But it was gave, more. It was, it was English gave the Irish uh, terrible time. Well, the Irish. Irish gave, us, gave the Italians terrible, and the African uh, Hell's Americans and terrible the time. You know, gangs of New York. I mean, yeah. is uh, left out the uh, all the lynchings during the Civil War. The, uh, the Irish and African American instead that I believe the Irish apologized for. Yeah. So you know the Irish uh, have a, have a, a love of the arts and poetry and produce a lot of artisans, but they they also have a um, they're known for, for you know the stereotypical right, but those, fighting and uh, right, but those those artists were all educated. Right, they didn't come out of nowhere. They were literate in the language. Mm -hmm. um, I mean Bernard Shaw is an example of of a highly educated, highly literate, brilliant, you know, writer. Um, there are others, Yeats. certainly, mm. yes, a lot of uh, poetry. But again, a lot of them were uh, quote-unquote English educated. Mm. Right? Uh, but generally, uh, the, the Irish, or in terms of their disenfranchisement for so many generations, uh, Certainly, were were betrayed. I mean, I think all of people's uh, sort of dig that have to dig themselves out of that betrayal seems to be that uh, that's the ancient brain notion of mobility, and uh, and sometimes that mobility is so contained uh, and so. Uh, put into stasis that you then have all of these civil disobedient wars and you know you have disobedient things happening wars and rebellions and so on that kind of oppression yeah. but um, but for me it wasn't an issue of that I had to fight my way out it was that I had to study my way out I had to um, Develop fluency is my way out. Um, when the teachers sent letters home to my parents that they should only speak English, interestingly enough, I supported it. You know, uh, until like I entered kindergarten with barely, not quite fluent, you know, in, in English, and. Uh, that's, those were the times when the idea of language development was really critical. Yeah, I mean, it is now accepted all sorts of mushiness around, you know, with bilingual and all of that stuff, and ebonics, you know, all of that sort of creating this whole weird middle space where generally people never move out of. Um, what perhaps isn't taken into consideration is that, that most of, of our parents, certainly all of our parents in the underclass, uh, many of them didn't attend school beyond elementary school. If some went on to junior high school. In other words, the Spanish that uh, is spoken by by uh, the underclass family is not very fluent. So the idea of being bilingual at that level really is. Um, and it's almost dialectic. It's uh, very. It's African. a colloquial. It's got a lot of colloquialisms, yeah. and it's um, it's not really the best way to approach the notion of being bilingual. Being bilingual, right. exactly. So, and then ebonics is just another sort of further institutionalizing of of the betrayal, which comes out of the disenfranchisement and not. Of being the educational system not serving uh, development of you know intellect of objectivity if, and fluency in language is critical to that. What kind of influence did your parents have on your spirituality? You mentioned to me one time in class. Well, my <coughs> certainly my aunt was very religious. Um, grandmother very religious. They had the usual saints all over the house with candles. Uh, lit for them, and uh, they insisted that my sister and I go to church, and we did, we went to the Catholic Church. Um, Pre-Vatican II Mass, Latin and incense. Yeah, exactly. I was an altar boy at the church. Uh, 
so I was right on the inside track of all that, holding the gold plate under the chin, and kneeling right up front. Yeah. So, and I was also altar boy at the High Episcopal Church. When we moved to Henry Street, there was a High Episcopal Church just on the corner. Okay. And while I was being altar boy at the Catholic Church, I periodically would be altar boy at the High Episcopal Church. You never went to the Spanish Orthodox Church on 4th Street? <laughs> no, no. See, again, you have to understand that, that I, I was busy, you know, however much it might be viewed as some sort of betrayal, you know, right. which my cousins, when I was in the barrio with them in the summers, just my still, you know, like talking about things I'd, I'd read, at, at school, any bit of piece of history or anything. I mean, they saw that as just like boring, kind of like, you know, you know, stop that kind of boring, right? They wanted to know about, uh, you know, violent movies and violent this and violent that and who they want to kick the shit out of and how do you make a zip gun and this, you know, how do you make a blowtorch? <laughs> it's just, it's just like, I mean, for them that was all, it was like G.I. Joe, you know, <laughs> kind of life. Uh, so, the, the, uh, they weren't religious either. They, they didn't know what about church or what that was or kind of thing. And in some strange way I feel that that contributed uh, to my uh, notion that there, there had to be some s more sensible way to make my way in the world. Now, it wasn't part of the mainstream. It certainly wasn't recognized and still isn't recognized by any of the, uh, you know, the state rights Grand Lodges. It's not part of the establishment, but what about the little Red Lodge down there in Hell's Kitchen that you told me about? Well, I mean, I mean, my father about? was a mason, uh -huh. and my mother was with the Eastern Star, so, you know, and they both were masons for like mason most of their lives, and, uh, I remember them always going off to meetings, and wanting me to become part of the thing, but I, I had, I just was trying to not, I was sort of busy trying to work out what my relationship was to God within the context of the church, you know, and I mean as a Catholic, baptized as a Catholic, being Catholic altar boy and so on, and uh, already I had read some of the translations, because there were already translations of the Bible, even though at the church they were all in Latin. Uh, you know, the Old Testament was already out there for the sort of born-again Christian types. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I, I was interested, again, <laughs> for me, Catholicism was uh, uh, much uh, uh, clearer, intellectually um, organized, a structure that, and the High Episcopal as well, that, that for me made much more sense than, than all of the emotional stuff. You like the liturgy. Yes, I, I, um, I, it just for me, and even when I was at the Orthodox synagogue and I had, you know, worked with, turned the lights on and stuff, and the rabbi was doing a rehearsal, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was just for me such fantastic theater. It was there was a certain kind of um, containing of emotion and and power that that had. That uh, I believe I might have attended uh, with an aunt of mine from the Barrio, one of those storefront kind of Iglesia, the yeah, kind of castle all of store the, holiness, you know, yeah, kind of very emotional, very yeah, yeah. and and for me that was I got. I couldn't, you know, I say, well, this is, you know, for me, it was just strange. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, the, the idea of, 
this is what I meant by acculturation, that it, you can't, you can't um, give loyalty to, to uh, activities, to structures that, that deconstruct all of the intention to intellect, to deconstruct it, that, that teach you uh, to, in a sense, put into the foreground the emotional body feltness, because with it is a logic, with it is a, a cognitiveness, and it affects your whole perception and sense of your place in the world and identity. It does not permit you to move on to intellect and objectivity. It doesn't. It's, it, uh, it sees, in other words, if we can give it an it, okay, uh, it, it responds to uh, intellect as, uh, as, as um, a threat. Okay, I mean, that would be the simplest way to put it, as a threat. And so, you, c you can't just have your, you know, your uh, rock and roll, your salsa, your hip-hop, you can't have it blasting over and over into your mind, all of that logic, which is at the center of it, all of that emotional body feltness at the center of it, and be conditioning yourself at the deepest imaginative levels with that kind of cognizing, with that kind of referencing, and then expect somehow that you, you know, it's going to just leave and make room for intellectual objectivity. It won't. It won't, because it's much more psychosomatic. And then what's interesting about intellect is that you can let it go, you know, as you move on to other intellectual relationships and ideas as you try to uh, reach some sort of objective understanding of something. But with the emotional uh, body felt, with the visceral, that isn't the case. It, it, it is felt. It is a body feltness of meaning. And that body feltness of meaning is very difficult to let go of. Whereas the intellectual is much easier to let go of. Right? And so for me, I just uh, was was busy deconstructing. Well, the reason I ask is because you know you you spent some time at a at a healing. Um... Yeah. By the way, one thing I want to add: this goes for bluegrass. This goes for you know any whether it's a, a Euro-centered kind of. Um, Music about the suffering and oppression and and uh, right. and wild release into some sort of freedom of you know expression. There, it's a similar. Uh, in my um, everything is art. Okay. 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 So art can be a way that makes you a really terrible villain. It, I mean, you know, nature has its poison mushrooms, mm -hmm. okay, and they're as beautifully configured and as elegantly structured and etc. as mushrooms that uh, people cut up for their favorite uh, wonderful dish, okay? So, uh, spiritual practice, um, spiritual practice uh, let me say spiritual process, okay, is inherently a part of everything. It's part of the uh, biobrain system architecture. The, for instance, the temporal lobe resonance at 40 hertz, that triggers uh, transcendent states. Uh, that's been studied kind of carefully. And it grew out of the study of uh, epileptics, uh, seizures, and their transcendent states that occurred during those uh, epileptic seizures. And there's a whole range of kinds of epilepsy, narcolepsies, and et cetera, et cetera. So, with that in mind, the people studying and doing research in this area, in a sense, wired the brain up, you know, to find out what is happening when someone talks to saints and being abducted by UFOs or speak to God. Mm -hmm. And they find that uh, 40 hertz, 
temporal lobe resonance is, is a critical part of the sort of vibrant system expression at the vibrant system level of that process. But guess what? They found that the temporal lobe 40 hertz uh, occurred when you help somebody up out of a ditch, you know, really concentrating on that activity, when you're dreaming, um, when you're meditating, when you're skiing downhill, you know, at the slalom. Uh, but they also found that that resonance occurs when you beat the crap out of somebody. When you are busy cursing someone to high heaven. When you're having a nightmare. Okay. So, that certainly makes clear that when we talk about spiritual, we have to then always introduce the notion of within what moral ethical framework is that spiritual work occurring. Mm -hmm. A strong belief in something, whether it's some f fascist, authoritarian, Nazi, you know, weird craziness, 40 hertz temporal lobe resonance, or whether it's you, you know, cheering on the importance of democracy, the importance of pluralism and equality of power shared by all peoples and so on. 40 hertz resonance. And it doesn't go above and below that. That's, 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 the, that's the resonance where you have that sort of sense of transcendence and oneness with things. And somehow that you're absolutely right, you know, and you feel you're absolutely right. You're in temporal low resonance, 40 hertz. There's some variation in there. I'm just using that as a marker. Hmm. Okay? So when you talk about uh, art serving a spiritual state, or mm -hmm. everything has a spirit, you know, whether it's getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth, you know, the, the spiritual is, is a part of our biobrain system architecture. It's part of the kind of resonance that is that we're capable of. Okay. Uh, your your third eye, your psychic ability, again, is can move either way. It's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. But you can't argue that I'm in a spiritual state, therefore I'm in some transcendent state of goodness. No, you might be in some transcendent state of badness. Okay, and this is what I mean. We, we've seen it happen with a lot of spiritual work, with a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. There are always those in there that, you know, imagine that they're doing the true work, dealing with all of this uh, sort of what gets real shady. It's something like black arts, you know, white arts. But I mean, that's another issue of light and absence of light. Uh -huh. Okay, which I prefer looking at it that way, because uh -huh. there's just too many associations we make within the, the kind of <clears throat> retributive reconciling around melanin, you know. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so, you have to understand the way the spiritual works. You have to understand that uh, that in the name of God, some of those horrible things have been done mm -hmm. to people. Horrible, horrible things. Mm -hmm. And and the people that have done it have felt that they were speaking God's, you know, will and, and testament and doing God's will and all of that kind of stuff because they were, you know, they were resonating at 40 hertz and they felt, you know, that somehow that they were one with God and that's with part of saving the soul. Okay, so what do you argue? You say, wait, wait. okay, the Inquisition. Well, well, what about the Inquisition? I mean, was that something that had to do with light or darkness? Well, I mean, clearly it had to do with darkness. It had to do with a bunch of insane, 
people who imagined that that's what God wanted them to do. Well, yes, that's that God back here. Mm -hmm. That ancient, limbic, feral-like notion of God. Struthiopithecines, maybe, you know, uh, H. habilis, you know, you know. Yeah. And, but when you get up here, when you get to that prefrontal lobe, and you get to the Messiah, mm -hmm. you have to be really freaky to interpret that role of the Messiah as serving um, some notion of onward a Christian soldier, onward as on to war, you know, with the cross of Jesus. I mean, you've, you've got to be really weird and freaked out and, and not understanding that that ancient brain architecture has just, you know, grabbed your prefrontal potential in, in cognition and is strangling, you know, is crushing, pulling it back. It's like some kind of self-created lobotomy kind of thing. No, I mean, it's pretty clear that if within the whole notion of, of Jesus that it was clear that he said, you know, no sacrifices after me. Mm -hmm. I'm it. You know, no more killing after me. You know, he, as he told, uh, you know, the jerk to pull out a sword and cut the ear off one of the guards. Mm -hmm. He said, put that sword away. What are you, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. I mean, it, there was certain realities he was dealing with when he had a few people carrying swords, except what we don't understand is that they were zealots. There were zealots amongst him. Mm -hmm. And the zealots were warriors. Iscariot is the name of the knife that was used to cut Roman throats. Mm -hmm. And Iscariot was amongst his group. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's just trying to understand that he was caught between, you know, the, the Essenes uh, who, who were uh, sort of supporting the Zealots and the Essenes who were sort of leaving all that behind. And it's, but it was clear that he argued for an end to sacrifice. You know, his sacrifice, you know, no more sacrifice, mm -hmm. no more anyone having to die for God. That's it, it's taken care of. Mm -hmm. So again, it's this idea of, of lucidity and intellect. And so when you have spiritual practice that wants to smother that, then you have to get suspicious. It's just simply out of loyalty to that more visceral, ancient, archaic way of cognizing. Mm -hmm. And it, it uh, infects everything. Spiritual work everything. I mean, that's like somebody going out there and gardening and you say, wow, that's interesting. Uh, oh, and I said, this became important. That's essence uh, of, of tradition. I'm speaking Freemason as we know it today. Yeah, but, but I think it's interesting to go back, uh, you know, far enough to see its roots uh, coming out of, whether it's Taoism, alchemy, uh, Kabbalah, you know, over far back Egyptian mm -hmm. uh, magic and so on. Theology. I mean, you could argue Moses was a mason, but I, <laughs> you know. Nimrod. Uh, yeah. So. Cain had the mark. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So, the the issue the issue always is what whatever is occurring. Is it serving to mature your potential in cognition, or is it taking you away from that potential? Whatever you're doing, all you have to do is ask that question. But that means you have to understand how cognition works, and what's happening to the resonance is, is just simply a state. The narrative content is where the cognitive mode comes in, because the cognitive mode, whatever the narrative content, you know, if you're for freedom and that's your narrative content, but you've got this visceral, ancient cognitiveness operating, well then, 
You're busy waving bombs and swords and anything, throwing rock, you know, anything you can within that sort of, uh, what was the movie, uh, uh, 2000s, what was it, uh, where they begin with the ape, with throwing us a, a bone and the bone spirals. Oh, no. okay. Uh, what is it? I, I can't remember. Uh, and then you see this metal sort of make the bridge between the sort of ancient chimpanzee self that's lurking in our consciousness and then the abstract cognitive creating this sort of steel, you know, obelisk kind of. Uh, Kubrick, was it Kubrick who uh, did that movie? Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, the 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 point always is that you you have to understand how cognitive process works, what our biobrain system architecture is, what its potential in cognition is, how it can be compromised, how narrative content uh, built into it, you should be able to decipher the cognitive mode that's driving it. Okay, and that that guides you. That guides you, and to the extent that you're loyal to that, then you're deconstructing any of the cognitiveness that would not serve your best interests within your potential as a sapien sapiens. You know, some 180,000 years, and we're still behaving, you know, in such a way that the chimpanzee will recognize us as a relative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I so. didn't commit myself to any particular school. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> I was sort of busy organizing my own sense of what the relationships of all these things were. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to work with what was as sort of pieces of the attempts to understand in, in some intellectual way, however much it might have been compromised by more limbic logic, which is uh, within a sort of iconic and lexical side of it is a, a coding that, that uh, seems to have a certain kind of mushiness to it very much like a code where I give you uh, two numbers, uh, three numbers. Mm -hmm. I give you a page, I give you a paragraph, and I give you the uh, five, five numbers, is it? And then I give you the number of where the word is and what letter in that word to use. But you have to know the title of the book. Okay? If you don't know the title of the book, what are you going to do with that information? So I was busy, in a sense, pulling together all the pieces of the code. Mm -hmm. right? And if I do that, enough of that, to the extent that you can decipher code, you might catch a word in here, and who knows, you might understand mm -hmm. what book I'm referencing in each case. In other words, each of those within that for, you know, right. call them uh, chambers of meaning. If you pull together all the pieces, you, you begin to understand the book that I'm writing, okay? like a chapter of that book. And that's what I was doing. I, I wasn't trying to say, oh, this person's really got it, and they've got the answer. Right. And I'm going to work within that answer. Mm -hmm. I decided no one has the answer, and a lot of people who think they have the answer really aren't anywhere near the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I. I spent a lot of time doing a lot of research, and I have over the years, you know, whether it's studying at the Rocky Mountain Healing Arts Institute or whether it's studying rebirthing or 
you know, the the Naropa material or what you know, whatever that Book of the Dead, etc., etc., the Egyptian material that you know, the Taoist, and you you know, it's just like an onion you peel and you peel, and mostly what you end up doing is crying. <laughs> <laughs> So it was, in a sense, looking at all of those fragments and to the extent that I understood the meaning of those fragments within their context, how I could take those pieces out and assemble, in a sense, uh, another creature of meaning. You know, kind of like the way nature works with uh, subatomic particles and or gene, you know, genes that seem to have codes in them that lead to certain activity in the forming of things. Okay, and understanding that uh, that w whatever the the potential is within that gene, and and it's the kind of instructions that go to it and the sequencing that cause it to in fact be faithful to its potential in realizing form. That um, that there are influences from the outside that can subvert that, and and uh, an example would be uh, uh, what happened with the um, uh, the infants born without limbs because of the chemicals they were given supposedly to take care of the nausea of the mother. That was originally used uh, for people who get nauseous and when air sick, I think is the term except what it did was disrupt the hormonal sequencing. And so that the gene doesn't go on and off by itself, it responds to hormonal processes. And the hormonal processes within the body are, you know, they're influenced by emotions, they're influenced by food, by chemistry, air we breathe, and so on. But this particular chemistry is very strong influence on the sequencing and so on, limbs are forming and so on. It says, oh, turn off. Right. So, so it, it's betrayed is an example of a betrayal. Okay, so it, it happens, the betrayal happens at the genetic level, it happens at the social level, intellectual level. You've got all these betrayals we have to pay attention to in order to resolve all the contradictions. Well, you can pay a lot of attention to as uh, I mean, some people are all caught up in the idea of uh, the the betrayal and abortion, right? but they have no concern about what they call postpartum abortion. That is to send somebody off to die somewhere. I mean, that's an abortion. Uh, there's no concern about all of the toxicity that uh, that a mother forming a fetus has, to, you know, is challenged by. No, no concern with that. No concern with the uh, economic structure within which that mother is forming the fetus, which affects the forming of the fetus. So, uh, all of these betrayals, uh, you know, they're just layers and layers. And uh, it's important that, that the spiritual work should, should take us, not, not take us back to all those betrayals in a way that uh, allows us to begin to understand their, their, their meaning. Okay. Um, within the, the way this society is organizing itself, within what cognitiveness, I mean, what kind of cognition is, is dominating? Uh, I mean, I, I can argue simply, it's very clear that um, the limbic system logic is in charge. System logic is in charge. And whatever intellect we evolve, develop, will serve that limbic system and all its retributive, you know, potential for retributive reconciling. And that explains uh, the most fiendish weapons, the most deadly 
I mean, that's, that's the uh, prefrontal lobe serving that ancient brain. It's sort of going back here instead of forward. Uh,